Matthew, thanks for joining me again. We wanted to pick up with your story, and there may be some people out there who don't know the story, but you are in court right now in Malta, where you live, um, and you're in court for a very interesting reason, could face jail time. Tell us a little bit about how we got here. What's what's the backstory? Right, thank you, Billy, my pleasure. So yeah, essentially this goes back uh, a few months now uh, where uh, last year I was invited to uh, share my story on a program and answer questions about so-called conversion practices. And um, I mentioned an organization as well that supports men and women who leave LGBT and an organization that promotes uh, biblical sexuality. And um, it just happened that uh, a few days after, or a few weeks, very few weeks, um, three people reported me to the police in Malta claiming that I was uh, breaching chapter five, six, seven in Maltese law, which says you cannot advertise so-called conversion practices. And please note, advertising was not defined in the same law at the time, because now if you had to look it up, it, it you, you can find a clause about advertising, which was added later because of this legal case, because the opposition were feeling like they couldn't find any uh, loopholes, you know, to trap us. But anyway, the point is that, you know, I had to go to the police and I exercise my right to be silent and uh, the the police press charges against me, and it's been uh, two hearings so far. We're on to the third one uh, this month, uh, on the 24th of July. And it just happens that, you know, if I'm found guilty, I could uh, spend five months in jail, or I could, um, you know, pay a fine of up to 5,000 euros in Malta just just for really exercising my freedom to be a Christian and to support others who want to move away from uh, unwanted LGBT identities or desires, et cetera. So yeah, that's the situation. And, you know, I, I appreciate you taking us through that because you were sharing your testimony, as you said, you were sharing your journey out of the LGBTQ lifestyle identity, right? Out of that identity into faith. You were sharing that on a show. I think to people in, in the West, in America in particular, this seems sort of strange. Like how in the world would you be brought up on any sort of charge for simply sharing your story, even if people disagreed with the story, even if you're advertising conversion therapy, which again, you were sharing your journey and your story. Um, how, how could that happen? Based on your experience in your country, looking at this story, I mean, five years ago, 10 years ago, would it have shocked you that you would be in a place where you could actually be brought up on charges for something so simple? Yeah, um, I think we've been feeling the tension uh, ever since this law came into effect. So it's the Affirmation of Sexual Orientation, Gender Identity, and Gender Expression Act in Malta. That's what it's called. Ever since it came into force in 2014, I think we could feel the bullying coming from, you know, extremist LGBT activists who really want to uh, try and silence the Christian voice. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we've had a few instances where, where people started threatening people like myself, you know, whenever I shared something or challenged a perspective that is LGBT affirming, you know, I would get people who say, oh, well, you know, you're, 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 you're breaking the law and we could report you to the police for that. So we could start to feel how, you know, people who are LGBT affirming were using this law to create intimidation. So we could feel the tension, but as Christians, we just on, on our island in Malta, we choose to be bold, you know, no matter what the cost, uh, it, you know, it's, it's worthy. Uh, Jesus is worthy. So, yeah, we, we, we just go for it. And, um, and I, I've shared my stories uh, several times. The only thing that I did differently this time is that I mentioned an actual organization uh, a bit more specifically, you know, and I discussed counseling and support and what it looks like. And this is in an atmosphere on an island where there are so many different LGBT support services and, and they're called counseling, they're called therapy, they've got numbers, you know, I didn't even mention any website during this conversation, didn't mention any cell phone number. If I advertised, I did a terrible job because I did not provide <laughs> any information, you know. 
But I think the I think the issue that people would have with this is that even if you did advertise, let's say you went on there and you said, "Call this number if you want to leave Absolutely. this lifestyle and you can get help." Isn't that your right as a human being to do that? I mean, that I think that's where this and and you as far as I understand, you're the first person to be prosecuted in this way under this law, correct? Um yes, yes, and and Malta I I would be and um and you're absolutely right, Billy. Um, it's it's our it's our right to promote uh, what we believe is is a is a lifestyle that builds families, that creates a society that is stable. You know, a, a heteronormative lifestyle, which we believe in, and we believe it's it's what has contributed to stability and peace and joy and harmony in our society. Doesn't mean that we didn't have any issues or problems. Far from it, um, but. But whoever promotes heterosexuality and biblical marriage is promoting something that edifies and builds our society. So in no way uh, should it be, uh, you know, sh- should it come under attack or should it be penalized. Absolutely. Can you help people understand? Because I think this is the powerful part of your story. And here you are sharing your testimony again, right? You have not shied away from doing that, even in the midst of this, some people would say, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to be silent now. I've already gone through enough here, but you're in the middle of these court proceedings. You haven't even had a chance to defend yourself yet in court. We're still hearing from you know, the, pro- the prosecution side of things, but talk a little bit about who you were before you became a Christian and who you are now, but help us understand that transformation. Sure, Billy. Uh, yeah, I I was uh, a practicing homosexual. It goes back to when I was a child and I experienced uh, confusion because of the fact that I, I wouldn't necessarily fit the, the male stereotype, you know? So I loved music and I was creative. I loved spirituality and I found it hard to make uh, friends my age and to bond with other guys. Maybe I just wasn't in the right environment. It happens. Um, so it was easy for me to feel like I was different, like I did not belong to the world of men. You know, I guess I was looking for a male role model in my life, which I struggled to find. Um, I, I couldn't find an older man who who could understand my language, who I could look up to. Um, and so, yeah, I my, my father was a good example. I have an older brother as well, but it just didn't click for me. So I spent more time with girls and um, you know, growing up, I, I I was introduced to pornography at the age of 11, which uh, kind of, uh, you know, cr- caused this premature sexual awakening in my life. And um, I realized that I was, you know, just really uh, romanticizing my feelings for men. And it caused a lot of confusion in my life. And in my teenage years, I tried to fit in. I tried to date girls, kiss girls, be in a relationship with with, with a woman to, to kind of, you know, try to please my friends and to look good and, and to go up the, the social scale. But um, I had a lot of insecurity, although I was in a relationship with a girl for three years, uh, sorry, for three months, actually. Um, but I had a lot of insecurity. I felt a lot of pressure and I did not feel like I was uh, experiencing what I was meant to experience with a, with a girl. So I stopped that relationship questioning who I was Um, and on social media started becoming a trend to declare your sexual orientation. And I was seeing like these guys say, oh, I'm bisexual, I'm this, I'm that. And I thought, okay, well, maybe that's who I am. Well, let me experiment. Let me try this and see how it feels. And I opened the door to homosexuality in my life and I was hooked. Um, And this was before I became a Christian. And, um, And then, you know, I entered into a serious relationship with a man that went on for about a year and a half. I was sexually active, but I was not happy. I did not feel like um, it was a natural thing for a man to be with a man. I felt something was not complimentary about that relationship. And it just was not satisfying, to be honest. Um, And so, yeah, it it was not a perfect relationship at all. And so, you know, then I, Christ reveals himself to me. I walk into this church in London and I'm, I'm receiving a revelation of the love of Christ. I I find a sense of belonging in the church. I find a sense of acceptance in the church and I fall in love with Jesus. I buy my first Bible. I encounter the scriptures about homosexuality in, in uh, the, the, the new Testament and Paul's writings 
and I'm thinking, oh, homosexuality is a sin. And if you do it, you don't inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so I've got some praying to do, I thought to myself. So <laughs> I started seeking God and this understanding hit me, you know, that homosexuality is not an identity. It's a practice in the Bible. And if you forsake it, if you repent from it, God does not call you a homosexual and you're no longer a homosexual. And I thought, wow, you know, it was so freeing for me knowing that I never have to come out permanently to my family and say, mom, I'm this, dad, I'm that. Like, I did not want this thing in my life. I did not want these desires. So this brought me hope. The word of God brought me joy, comfort, hope to be the man that God called me to be. And that's my story, you know, and it's been this process of, growing in my identity in Christ. Well, and you know, you flash forward now into this battle and you're not willing to back down. You're there, you're defending yourself. What are you hearing from other people, you know, in Malta? Like how are people, I know this has been a big news story there and it has been around the world as well. What are you hearing? How are people reacting? Even people who don't know you? Uh, thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm very grateful for uh, the support of Christians all around the world, um, or, you know, and it's interdenominational, really, like Christians from various denominations who have shown me love and prayer support. So thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. But on the other hand as well, I think um, there there has been uh, one person from the media in Malta who, who did speak favorably. <clears throat> um, but I noticed, Billy, that the media in Malta is very silent. Uh, however, the media reported uh, like things about how the case proceeded in, uh, during my last hearing. So the reporting went across. However, I never got interviewed by the media. So I'm noticing that I think the media is very hesitant and would not want to give me a voice at this time, at least in my country, um, talking about secular media because we don't really have Christian media in Malta, unlike in the US. Um, well, wouldn't but they also be, I mean, hypothetically, if you go on and you have the conversation you're having with me right now and they air that in some way or cover it, would they also then be accused of violating that law and advertising, you know, conversion therapy potentially? I mean, is, do you think that might be why they're withholding? What I noticed, Billy, is that in, at least in Malta, and I, I'm sure it's not just Malta, but it's like, it depends on who your friend is and it depends on how much influence you have depends on you know who you're friends with as an organization as a media house you know so i think you know that that the secular folks know how to protect each other because they need each other to survive and so i don't think they would dare you know do anything against an organization that they need because of the very few resources we have on the island um, so it's, it is a bit like that, to be honest. So final question for you, and we're going to keep up on this case as you go here. I know you, again, you have your, your next court date is coming up here. Um, what happens if things at the end of this trial don't go the way you hope they go? What will you, what will you do? Um, well, what is my expectation? Um, I, I would say that I, I really do believe that God is going to come through and usher us into victory here because, um, well, uh, first and foremost, the law was, was not strong enough. The first, the, 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 the first draft of the law was not strong enough to kind of penalize us. So that's definitely to our favor and advantage. And, and second of all, you know, our fundamental freedoms are being breached here. And I believe there are not just constitutional laws in Malta, but also European uh, laws and international laws that protect us in this scenario. And so we intend to keep fighting this, even if it goes to the European courts of human rights. Um, so I, I think worst case scenario, you know, um, I, I think I want to be like Paul, the apostle in my life. I want to be able to say, I know what it means to live in abundance. I know what, what it means to live in lack, you know. Worst case scenario, you know, prison and sharing Jesus in prison and just suffering for, for the sake of Christ and counting it all joy for the prize of knowing him, knowing that he's producing perseverance and, in our faith and he's strengthening our faith through every trial. So you know what? I see that 
no matter how bad this gets, we're going to count it all joy because we're not suffering for something wrong that we have done. We're suffering. We're counted worthy to suffer for the sake of the gospel and his name. So that is always a source of joy for Christians and believers. But um, we we want to live to leave something for the next generation that is not hostile towards the Christian faith. And I think that is, is worth fighting for. Well, Matthew, we will continue to keep up on your case. I appreciate you speaking now, continuing to share your story. Thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone. Love you loads.